So the webinar today is uh, part of the DUPC2 uh, series that we organize for our partners on e-learning. And we had several webinars before on uh, open education, on um, uh, distance communication and distance teaching. And this one uh, is a specific one on open educational resources with the title Open Education Perspectives for Water Resources with examples from GIS and hydrogeology. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, we have as a guest uh, Sol Montoya from uh, Hatari Labs. He makes great tutorials that are, uh, you find a lot on social media, uh, free webinars on all things that have to do with uh, groundwater modeling and the use of uh, Python, for example, and Modflow. Um, so it's about uh, open educational resources. And first, we also handled that in the previous webinars. It's a question about what does open really mean in, in open education, uh, open access and these things. Well, it means that uh, a piece of data is open if anyone is free to use it, to reuse it and to redistribute it. Um, and that means that there can be only very few restrictions to that. And um, there are only two restrictions according to the open definition that you can ask to attribute. So who made it, which person or organization, and you can use um, share alike. To attribute means that you have to refer to the organization or person and share alike means that uh, everything that you derive from the materials should also be openly shared in a similar way with a similar license. I'll not cover licenses in this presentation. I did that in another webinar. So open education has different uh, products. Uh, we have MOOCs, we have webinars and um, all kinds of other open access materials. And of course we do that because our core business is to, to share our knowledge. But I want to go a bit deeper uh, into uh, why do we want to, uh, to share knowledge openly and uh, what are then uh, the, the results of that what, that we can use. But let's first of all check the definition of open educational resources. So strictly it's any freely accessible openly licensed material, text, media, uh, digital stuff that uh, are useful for teaching, learning and assessing, as well as for research purposes. That's the official uh, definition. And basically it's publicly accessible materials that uh, users can use, reuse, improve, redistribute. Now, in this presentation, I go a bit uh, further to not only have the, the completely open ones, but also the ones that are have a few more restrictions like non-commercial use or that you just can view it on the internet, which is also very useful. So why uh, open educational uh, resources? That's the main question. Of course, we want to, in our organizations as a knowledge institute, we want to um, disseminate our knowledge as widely as possible. But open educational resources, are particularly useful to increase our visibility as our organization, but also to increase the visibility of uh, specific experts who disseminate that material like uh, Sol and me are doing. Uh, in that way, we can increase impact because many more people can use it. And we can get feedback from a wide audience on uh, our materials and their interests. I will go into more details on these different aspects. What is also very useful is to create uh, or to be part of a certain community. So uh, if you're into uh, GIS, you can be part of a community dealing with GIS or particular GIS, open source GIS, or particular tools like QGIS. Um, and the open educational resources also give you um, access to a different audience because in our institute, we have a certain audience that, uh, that come to study with us or go for short courses. They uh, can apply for scholarships. Uh, so that's based on different criteria than the people who are just out there finding open educational resources and uh, they have different backgrounds. And that's interesting to know. Um, I'll also follow up on that later. And then open educational resources are quite easy to make because you can open up parts of existing materials that you already use in e-learning. So certain videos, certain uh, tutorials that you already made. It's easy to implement without an e-learning infrastructure. You can use infrastructure that's out there on, uh, on the internet. So uh, you can use platforms like, uh, like YouTube or Google Drive. I'll talk about that a bit. Um, 
so it uh, expands the access to learning, uh, not a specific registration database that you need to set up, but you use popular tools. It can be in any format. And it's a very rapid way of uh, disseminating because there's not much regulation on it. You don't need to give credits or diplomas. Uh, from the side of the user, it's uh, cost saving. So for lifelong learning and uh, keeping yourself up to date, uh, that's very useful for your uh, participants who uh, access the open educational resources. And then uh, another important aspect is that it's uh, more and more getting a requirement from a government or a donor, if you're a Knowledge Institute project funded, that you disseminate as open educational resources. Now it has to fit also with your business model as your organization. And uh, I've explained the business model also in other webinars. I'm not going to repeat uh, the whole theory behind this. You can, you can look that back. But the essential is that with the different materials that you produce as, a, as an educator, um, you have different rates and different amount of participants that can uh, use it. So for the free materials like open courseware and open educational resources, you have many participants that can use it and it has no cost. The assumption is that that's very accessible and useful for people who don't need support because it doesn't come with any support. It also doesn't come with a diploma or other things. It's just as it is. That's also the big disclaimer with the open materials. No expectations, it's just as it is. But we know from our experience that many people need uh, support in different ways or a different product than just having a video out there on the internet or the, the tutorials. So you can present things nicely in a book, especially for computer courses. Books are still uh, popular uh, as hard copy also because then you can have it next to your screen where you do the exercises. Um, many people buy still uh, books, very good. And then there's the online course where you also provide support and you can provide a diploma and course credits. There's uh, short courses that can be face to face where people come uh, to your institute and uh, meet you as an expert. Then we have tailor made trainings that's for specific organizations asking you for specific uh, training materials to develop, which is state of the art and they come with a budget for that. That's the most interesting part uh, from uh, R&D perspective, if it's about uh, development of education. And then there's the master programs that you might give in your uh, Knowledge Institute, like a university, um, where the, uh, less people are following those materials, but uh, they have access to the full, uh, the full scale of, uh, of the educational product, including uh, diplomas, face-to-face -face contact, credits, etc. So as I explained in an earlier webinar, the innovation and the development takes place there. And what I'm going to explained today is that these open educational resources play an important role in finding that audience who wants those tailor-made trainings and to, um, to show what you have as an expert and as an institute. So webinars are really uh, useful to uh, find out your market potential. So a webinar is one form of an open educational resource. So we are now currently in a webinar and it can be very low profile. Today we use uh, Yitzi, it's open source. You can also use uh, expensive tools for that. Uh, we try out always different tools. So let's see how this works. Um, and we evaluate uh, what, what works best for a certain uh, project or, or audience. And uh, I recently finished a series of seven webinars with uh, my co-author, uh, Kurt Menke, the QGIS Hydro webinars. And uh, they were very successful. Um, we found out that many people registered for it and they come from many different countries as the map uh, showed and created a kind of community that got engaged with us and uh, it was really nice to, to figure out who is using the materials and in what way and how they learn and see their progress uh, during all the webinars. So if you have open educational resources, where do you put them? So webinars are live. So you use a platform for that to have live communication like, uh, like Yitzi or like Zoom or, or other tools. But um, for other more asynchronous types of open educational uh, resources, uh, if you don't have your own infrastructure, you can use, for example, YouTube, make a YouTube channel. It doesn't cost anything. You upload your videos there, get some experience. You need to invest a little bit in a good, uh, microphone and a good camera if you want to show your face, it's not even necessary. 
And um, YouTube also comes with uh, all kinds of uh, monitoring and evaluation tools. I'll show that later, but it also has the opportunity that you can engage with your audience through comments. They can ask questions. Uh, I'll also come back to that. Another uh, alternative for that is Vimeo. Um, I heard that people who don't have infrastructure also can easily use the Google uh, Docs environment to post their all kinds of tutorials, um, share documents, even make forms with Google Forms. Another nice uh, thing for computer-based courses, especially for programming languages like Python or R, uh, is the, are the Jupyter Notebooks. So you can easily make them on your own computer. And if you store uh, the Jupyter Notebook on GitHub, uh, where a lot of source code can be stored, then you can connect with a tool which is called Binder to that. And then you have launched your online course without any server that you yourself have to run. I'll show some uh, screenshots in a bit. That's very useful. And uh, GitHub Pages uh, is very useful if you want to make a, a website uh, with a simple markdown language, as it's called, where you can, uh, can uh, add your tutorials, uh, a link to all kinds of uh, resources that it's very easy and uh, free to set up as long as you have a GitHub account. And there are many, many other ways. I'm also curious to know from you if you uh, find some uh, easy uh, ways to share your open educational resources if you don't have a whole uh, e-learning environment like, uh, like Moodle, for example. So this is a screenshot from my YouTube channel. So there you host your videos. You can easily upload it. Um, people can subscribe and then uh, they get automatic updates. So that's a way to create a community. Uh, you can have an intro video uh, showing what you have to offer and you can discuss with people. You can make uh, playlists on certain topics and you can reach out to the community by posting uh, things uh, that you are doing and that's interesting, announce uh, webinars, for example. And you can advertise other things like here, the IHG Delft uh, courses, uh, links to social media, to other websites. So it's another useful thing that you can do with your YouTube channel. And it, you don't have to set up the infrastructure, it's already there. One disadvantage is that some countries cannot uh, access YouTube. Uh, therefore, you need to look for, if that's your target group, you need to look for other uh, platforms. This is a screenshot from the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, and this one uh, I made for a Python course, a basic Python course, and uh, it's stored on GitHub and through Binder, anybody in the world can just launch it and uh, run it as an online course. Uh, it's interactive, so you can type and run your code there and, uh, and it's theory in between. A very easy way to uh, present uh, computer courses. Now, what's very important is monitoring and evaluation because you want to achieve impact. You want to see that people learn from uh, your stuff. You want to know who it is, uh, their backgrounds, but you also want to see how it uh, impacts the sales of your courses or the other products like, uh, like books. And here we see for the QGIS Hydro webinars, uh, a graph of the sales of the book. And we see that uh, the webinars increased uh, the sales. It caused a jump, which is uh, almost as big as the, the Christmas sales. So we can directly uh, measure the impact of the webinar on uh, the sales of the book. For the YouTube channel, we can also get all kinds of analytics that are provided by YouTube. Um, so you can see here for the whole lifetime uh, of my uh, YouTube channel, the, the increase of uh, views. And you can see that the peaks are very much related to the amount of videos that you publish. So the more you publish, of course, the more people will view and will know uh, you and will subscribe. So that's very important. You can also, for one video, this one was posted yesterday, you can uh, check how well it's performing. So in the gray area, you see the uncertainty band of the, and, uh, the average video. And you can see that in the first hours, it was performing much better than the average, and then it stabilizes. This gives you some information about what the audience likes and how much the, the attention lasts for such a video. What's also interesting uh, to see is what are the, the topics that people like most. Uh, this is an overview of the whole lifetime of my YouTube channel. So of course, the, the videos that are there longer are more popular than the more recent ones. So it's better to look at it in the recent uh, months or, or years. 
And uh, yeah, here we see that catchment and stream delineation uh, is uh, very popular. Uh, many views. In, uh, this is the top five. And you also want to know how do people reach you, reach your, uh, know about your your videos. And uh, yeah, most from external sources. Uh, so mostly they, they search on YouTube, but from the external sources, they come from uh, the Google search mostly, or from the IHG Delft website, uh, or or searches on, on YouTube itself in another way. And social media is less. And you can also see the performance of your uh, playlists. And we see that the most popular playlists are the, the theoretical lectures. Um, now, if we dig a bit further in those analytics, we can see that most people uh, on the whole lifetime of the, the channel come from uh, India, most visitors, uh, and then from United States and then other countries. We see that the gender balance is not uh, not okay. Uh, any suggestions to improve it? I'm welcome, uh, welcoming that, but uh, most are male. And so based on this slide, we can say most of them are Indian male of around uh, 25 to 34 uh, years. But that's quite some information about your uh, target group that you're reaching with these videos. And then you also want to see how does your open educational resources impact the visitors on your open courseware platform, like we have at IHE. And we can see here a peak that is caused by uh, a MOOC from Afri Alliance. And here a peak that is caused by uh, an earlier webinar that we gave. So it's important to, uh, to measure. So there's some good practice advice. So be aware of your business model. How do your open educational resources fit in your business model. It's mostly a marketing tool and to show people what you can do in a very easy way. You need to monitor and evaluate to find out uh, who your target groups are, what are popular topics, devices, etc. It's a good advice to work with registrations or subscriptions because then you also know um, who are uh, following you and you can also reach out to them and give them updates actively. This is an important one. You need to find a balance between uh, your personal outreach as an expert. So I have my personal YouTube channel, but I use it as marketing for IHG Delft products. Uh, and uh, that goes well, I would say, because that's a win-win, but you always need to have, a, I think, a good discussion about this uh, on where the balance is. And, and uh, depends a bit on how much you can trust people to, uh, to do that balance in a good way. It's the same with you publishing a book. You, know, you can publish a book on personal title using all your IP that you gained uh, in your organization without mentioning the organization. And that's of course not a really good thing. And I think it's very important to build a community around your educational materials. So you know uh, th th that will give added value to, uh, to both sides. Now some challenges about, or good things and challenges about interaction with users. I made your skill from green to red and uh, I'll put on the screen some uh, uh, comments on, uh, on the YouTube channel. And you always need to think what does fit with your, uh, your aims, your business model, uh, what you want to achieve and what doesn't. So of course, what gives very much uh, uh, energy are our complements. What really does not give energy is, um, yeah, requests. So next webinar on flood analysis, please. Yeah, that's, you know, we also uh, do, do consultancy and we need to develop things and it costs us time. So uh, re requests with very broad topics are not very helpful. If you want to know something specific and then you could in a kind way, of course, ask it. So this person asks about uh, something in detail about a video, how you determine some thresholds. Now that's a really good question that you can simply answer. You also hope that people help each other. I don't see that happening much. So most, mostly I'm answering those questions. Um, this one, uh, yeah, again, a, a request and also about the quality of the video. But yeah, if you put your comment one minute after uploading, then uh, even YouTube is not fast enough to put it in HD quality. So people also need a bit of patience with you when you do that. Uh, here's somebody who, uh, who asks uh, basically an uh, exam question or an assignment. So you need to be very sensitive to that and don't go into that too much of helping people out with the problems they have at school because that's not your job. And you can see it about how specific the comments, etc. are. So there, there's some more examples here. This one is an interesting one about 
uh, how to get a DTM of one meter. I get a lot of these questions. How can I get the, the land use map that you showed for Europe for some country in Africa? Well, that's a deeper problem that relates to open data availability. And somehow people expect me to have the answers uh, to questions they have to solve in their, in their countries. Okay. Some final slides. So uh, open educational resources are a great opportunity to achieve outreach through social media. So every time you publish something, also publish it on uh, social media to uh, acquire attention. Keep in mind that millennials are used to learn from short videos. So open educational resources are, uh, are mostly very short materials, say maximum five minutes that show some trick. And they use the mobile phone. We see here a graph from our open course where we see that uh, the mobile phone use is uh, very much increasing compared to the computer. And then, uh, yeah, outreach on social media also gives you all kinds of analytics that you can uh, use. So webinars really uh, give a lot of uh, outreach potential. And you can market also on LinkedIn, which also gives a lot of interaction. So concluding slide, it's important to uh, define always for yourself your objectives. What do you want to achieve with the open educational resource? Which uh, target group are you looking for new ones? The efficiency, make it fit in your general business model. Establish a monitoring and evaluation framework. So you also know that you achieve your objectives or if you can uh, change things in your setup. Marketing through social media, very important. Find a balance between personal and organization outreach. And of course, dare to share. Don't be afraid to share. And normally I end webinars with uh, geo beers. And I can also give that as a recommendation for if you present something to a community, give them the opportunity to discuss with you, to, to be open and to find each other. And uh, these geo beers have been a great opportunity for that. Nadine, maybe you can... Uh, Tell me if there were some questions. Hi, Hans. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks a lot for your presentation. Very interesting. There are no questions at the moment. I would like to mention once again that if you have any questions, please post them in the chat box. Um, it's the third icon from the left on the bottom left. And there you can open the chat and post any questions you have. I will collect them and put them forward to uh, Hans and so later. Can I ask a question? Sure, go ahead. I was wondering, because you're sharing a lot of information with uh, others, what have you learned yourself from doing these exercises? Two things. I learned how to make open course or open educational resources. That's already very important because when you start with it, you're experimenting quite a bit with that. But content wise, you learn a lot from uh, that group that is following your stuff because some are really uh, innovative and really ask questions that you think, hey, I need to figure this out and uh, or even find mistakes and help you improve your material. So there's, there's really a win-win there. Okay, great, thanks. Um, well, I would say continue. I would like to encourage once again people to post questions in the chat box, also experience they have with this kind of exercises, um, challenges, uh, positive things, everything you would like to share. Thanks, okay. Nadine. Uh, then we can give the floor to, uh, to Saul. Go ahead, Saul. Okay. Hi, do you hear me well? Yes. Yes, okay. Okay, it's nice to, to be in this webinar. Thank you, Hans, for the invitation. Uh, I will talk about my presentation that is, okay, I hope. Um, well, my part of the presentation of Open Education Perspective for Water Resources and examples in G from GIS and Hydrogeology. Okay, about us, Gida Hatari and Hatari Labs are two platforms for knowledge sharing in Spanish and English. We use extensively the social media and web resources. We provide education based on open source software. So that means no more change to the students. 
and we develop content a tutorial based on the latest open source open software releases on the history gidahatari.com has more is more than eight years old while hatari labs is is has only three years old it's only three years old both are websites both in fact are websites of a consulting company so in the end we are a consulting company um, we develop at the beginning we develop social networks and events but only in peru and in 2016 we started to give online courses and with always developing tools i mean there was a lot of experiencing here purpose a university is an institution of higher education. By why a website should educate in applied tools for water resources? First of all, we love what we do, and we are convinced that better education will create better water resources professionals, and better professionals will contribute to a sustainable water resources management. And, okay, this is the main purpose of why we post tutorials. And uh, because it's profitable, in the end, it's a good business model. So how we manage our business model of doing tutorials, but also earning money. Uh, we spend 50% of our time doing tutorial posts and webinars free of charge. People visit our website, know us, follow us, and then buy a course or contact us to develop a model or evaluation. If we don't post, people won't, won't buy courses, and this is this can be measured. If if we stop posting, there will be no uh, no contact for projects, or like they won't buy any of our commercial courses. So far, uh, we always had work, and our business model is very versatile, especially with drops on the economy, the stock market crash, or in these COVID times. On the matrix, uh, matrix are kind of mixed for both um, for both websites. Um, Gida Hatari has more than 44,000 followers in Facebook, while Hatari Labs only is close to 4,000 followers. On Twitter are almost the same, less than 1,000. On YouTube, uh, that we consider YouTube the most powerful channel, okay? Um, we have more than 16,000 uh, followers in Gida Hatari, while we have um, close to 5,000 followers in Hatari Labs. We have a newsletter from the beginning, and the newsletter in Spanish has more than 4, 000, uh, 14,000 subscribers, while in English only has 1,500. On visits per day, yeah, Hatari has more. It's around 2,000 visits. Around 2,000 visits per day. Sometimes we reach 3,000 visits per day. It depends on what we post. Uh, while in Hatari Labs, we only we are about we are a little bit more of 1,000 um, visits per day on a weekday. Okay. On total web sessions on Yeah Hatari, we have around 3 million web sessions. While in Hatari Labs, we only have half a million. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about open education. Education is the process of facilitating learning and the process of acquiring knowledge, skills, and values. But how we educate? Uh, we educate through posts, through tutorials, through webinars, and through courses. And let's talk about open education. I mean, for us, what is open education? It's a synonym of learning by yourself. Open education has to be always online. How we change the attitude, the attitude of professionals throw, towards open software? And how can we motivate professionals to learn new stuff independently of receiving a certificate or a diploma? How can we prove the quality of our material? And how can our education can make changes on water resources management? On the education topics, uh, water resources is a vast topic, but we develop content mostly on groundwater modeling, spatial analysis, and computational fluid mechanics. These are the topic, these are the themes of most of our tutorials. 
There are other interesting topics that need another websites like water supply, water treatment, hydrological modeling. Okay. There are still uncovered topics in water resources um, to, that, have, that need some interesting websites. Okay, with the leave content-based education, uh, we content can be improved with rich media, and YouTube and or any video improve the user experience and the concept of understanding. Okay, um, this is a final remark. Success of online education is the environment creation for a learning experience. Everything that we gave through the website, videos, and rich media only helps only creates an environment because it's the student that is the one that will acquire knowledge. We are only a tool for that. Um, is um, on the development of this presentation, uh, we came from we came to this to this question is is education an experience? And maybe it is. We 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 couldn't answer that Really clearly, but we we have to create an amazing experience to give value to the content. I mean, uh, we we need everything is related to the experience. We need uh, it doesn't matter how how good your con your tutorial is if is if it, if the students or like do not have a a nice experience in by learning this. But how, how to give value to something that is open? I mean, if it's open education on the people conceptualization means that it's free and maybe the quality is not assured, not assured because you have not paid for that. And we, we, give, we can give value to the content because it's clear or because it's well explained. And we can give value because it can be applied to common problems. And because of the passion, we devote in developing this content. And this is a new topic. We have, we, if we want that people follow our tutorials, we need, uh, it's, you really need to put a lot of passion on what you do. Uh, and then um, the knowledge paradigm. There are two, two approaches to knowledge. On a Latin American perspective, is the close approach, like it says, do not share your knowledge. It is good that other people don't know, so you can excel among them. And there is the open approach and say, share what you know, so other people will know your capabilities and more things can be done. Unfortunately, the first approach is the most common around here in Latin America. They have told us the close approach, just to keep the knowledge for our for ourselves. But if you are trying to be famous on on the social networks, you need to use the open approach. You have to share the best of your knowledge, otherwise nobody will follow you because nobody follows a bad content. That means that nobody follows tutorial with all software mediocre tutorials, bad video production, or boring teachers, okay? The student model. People follow your tutorials because they need or because they follow you. It's hard to measure the success of open education unless there is a test, okay? But the test is, can be missing. And there is an involuntary scope or matrix on visits, on likes, and shares. Because of this matrix, we think that we have been successful. Okay, we think that we that we created something. Okay, maybe it's not exactly true, and it's hard to provide a specific support. And a final and a remark on this is that the student is the base of open education, and we need to focus more on the student opinion and the student experience. Okay, let's talk about support. That is something that is kind of very um, it's, it's extremely important, but it also has some um, some special remarks. It can be a resource-consuming activity. 
I mean, you can spend lots of time just answering questions. And we can provide a specific support. I mean, we can provide the answer for the assignment of the of somebody, or we can provide the maybe even we can even provide the what is the reason of the error of somebody that has done the, your tutorial and he couldn't finish that maybe and there could be thousands of reasons but we can provide a specific so a specific support for that problem okay we usually answer comments to our website on the day we answer emails on two or three days as well as the facebook message but in this type, and uh, we don't reply to YouTube comments. We don't know why. I mean, because we have a lot of YouTube comments and we, <laughs> we, we have never replied to them. Um, um, and well, let's, let's, let, let's hope that in the future we can do something about that. And let's talk about influencers because we are Open education is close to social media and social media is close to influencers. Okay. And what is an influencer? It's a person that has the power to affect decisions. Or what are resources? Uh, it can affect thesis topics, software usage, and policy making. It's powered by social media. And an influencer, voluntary and involuntary, can do a lot of benefits or can do a lot of harm. Okay. And currently, there are few influencers and water resources. Not everybody knows each, each other on the web, but more will come. Okay, let's talk about software tools. Okay, what's the difference in between an applied blog and a knowledge sharing platform? Um, you can have a blog on whatever topic you want to develop by the tools that Hans, uh, that Hans has talked about. But, well, we consider, our, we consider ourselves a knowledge sharing platform. That is a kind of um, another step on, on open education. And um, basically, the, the difference is the type of contents, the amount of events, and the amount of software involved. We use software for everything to keep our website. So we use softwares, mostly in Python, for sending the newsletter, for signing up for courses, and for to create and send courses certificates. On our website, we use databases as MySQL, as PostgreSQL, and MongoDB. And we, we use Squarespace to, to launch our website. And we use Modoboa, that is a complete set of tools to, to maintain the newsletter and the email. And we use Model as online platform. And we are about to launch a question and answer website for open source software. So, I mean, this will be, I don't know if you know Stack Overflow. Um, well, we are going to launch something like Stack Overflow, but for water resource, open source, open software in water resources. Because it's needed. I mean, like, there is no a central part where you can put questions. Okay, this is a topic that I talk about. That I talk hands that is really new. That is what is a webinar on demand. This is something. Uh, sometimes we create tutorials on demand. So a guy send put a post a comment or send an email and say, hey, why don't you create a tutorial on this topic? Okay, and say, okay, this is a good idea. Okay, we learn as well from that. But it's also but it's also possible to deliver classes on demand. And this is why it's important, because it creates an active behavior of students towards knowledge, because students require that they want the topic of the classes that they want. So this is an example. This is in Spanish, but they say, hello, my name is Dad. I am from the University of Cusco. Uh, we have seen your YouTube videos, but we would like that you gave us a webinar about Modflow. 
because we want uh, to continue our education during this quarantine. Okay, so I received this on my LinkedIn and I say, okay, and I told you, okay, that could be possible, but how, uh, how could I know that you are really interested? And say, uh, why don't you use, why don't you post a Facebook event? But in this case, they have done a survey. So they have done a survey and where they have to complete their data and they have to give preference for the they have to give preference for the for the uh, for the webinar and the type of computer they have etc okay so the survey on the survey 100 people were interested so we post the event actually the event is will be in 4 hours from now okay and the event um, is in Spanish and people have signed up to our Moodle um, website and we have so far 54 participants that have signed up for this event so and this uh, we are really happy on that because it's, it's an approach that the students is more proactive on deciding why they want what they want to know okay um, well, I think that is a successful experience of open education. Um, which is the future of open education in water resources? Um, finally, is we want to create better, later, better learning experience. Okay. Um, we have to keep all, always that in mind. To, we have to focus on the learning experience. We have to create the student interest. And the future is also to create things together among institutions, okay? Because uh, the student um, sees value in that, okay? Because it's not what you teach, it's what you teach together of what the other institution te teach, teaches. And, and then the, maybe the future of open education is open, not online education, but open and in-person education. So, I mean, free classes or open classes on a classroom. And the future of open education is also new tutorial for open soft for open softwares because open there is a lot of open new open software that is being developed and this new open software that is being developed has excellent documentations but for example for the latest modflow 6 uh, release there are no courses on that because no, there is no teacher on that. Okay, so our tutorial maybe is the most reliable uh, source of education if you want to learn those, those softwares. Okay, if you like what we do or you want to follow us, this is our um, social networks in English. And if you speak Spanish, you can follow us in our network in Spanish. Well, I think that this was my presentation and thank you for Hans for this opportunity. I don't know if there are some questions. Thank you, Sol. Uh, that was really a great presentation and great to see how you see the things. <laughs> uh, I can surely recommend uh, the people who watch the, this webinar to, uh, to, to follow you and, and to find out what uh, Hatari Labs is doing. Um, in, in courses and, and webinars and especially open educational resources you're quite strong on that. I, I know so from, from social media, we met uh, uh, only later at the open source uh, QTIS conference and, and got in touch with each other. So you also see how it builds your network in that way. Mm -hmm. um, I noted a few things that I would like to, to discuss uh, with you before we uh, go into uh, the, the plenary discussion. So you mentioned also that uh, yeah, the people who follow this, they of course they don't get a, a diploma or credits, but uh, do you also see like what, what I observed that uh, they are really motivated people because they still follow your webinars, even they know that they don't get any monetary compensation or a diploma. Um, and I find them very engaging. Is that also your ex experience? Um, yes, um, I mean, because we have a policy that we don't 
we don't have to give diploma for everything. I mean, like if you attended a webinar, is this is actually that you were there? I mean, it doesn't mean that you actually learn. Okay, so if you if you learn, you have to to provide a document or maybe doing a test or a quiz and say, okay, I have learned these concepts, and this costs money. I mean, this is exactly yeah. that's an added value product which you would ask money for. Yeah, but I like the intrinsic motivation part of the the people who follow open educational resources that they are very motivated to spend time uh, in their free time, often to to watch webinars and. Uh, and to engage with us. And there is, there is another, for example, as a groundwater modeler, uh, resources of education are really scarce, really, really scarce. If you want to learn Modflow, is, I mean, you have the Modflow documentation, some videos of the developer for Model Muse, and our tutorials. That's it. There is no, yeah. And for us, the our videos take really long. I mean, we can have a video for 40 minutes, we can videos even with errors. <laughs> Sometimes we our video is um, is split because, we, because I, I couldn't solve something and then I have to retake in another video. Um, yeah, but this is the only is maybe one of the scarce sources of tutorials in, in English and in Spanish. And we see that as an opportunity. Yeah? That's the same with the stuff that I do with QGIS for hydrological applications, is that, yeah, there are no good classes yet on that, no textbooks, no tutorials. There, there's a lot, of course, but all uh, nicely in the open educational resources environment. And I see many colleagues around the world making stuff, but being specific for hydrology, there wasn't much. And then that's a great opportunity to profile uh, yourself as an expert, your organization as being having expertise in that and to get uh, this uh, motivated uh, target group who really follow those things. Mm -hmm. I have a question about your uh, webinar uh, on demand idea. I also mm -hmm. like that very much. Um, so how do you see the, you, you have now experienced with it and today you will have such a, a webinar on demand. So uh, probably you still have to learn from how that goes, but mm -hmm. how would you operationalize such a thing? Because now it was an email that came in and I also receive a lot of these emails and some you think, okay, let's do it. And for others you think, let's don't do this. Um, so how, what are guidelines for that? Um, in order to, to, I mean, which is the decision tree of making or not making the, the yeah, uh, criteria that you have? Uh, yes, it cannot be from, uh, it, they have always to present that they represent a group like a group of students or maybe a university or something like that. I mean, if somebody appears by their own, maybe we won't create any webinar on that. And most of the webinars on demand are actually topics that we know that are not well, well covered. I mean, like, uh, or maybe basic topics. Uh, I think that the main criteria is, uh, is the, the related group that are asking for this course. This is, yeah. this is the main uh, idea. I find that also important because a question that is only interesting for one person does not give you enough uh, justification of spending time on figuring out things and recording a video. And also you are quite sure then that not many people will watch it because it's too specific or too general. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Nadine, are there any questions from the audience? Uh, no, not in the chat box. I don't know if you want to give people the opportunity to unmute themselves. You can use the raise hand functionality so we can see if there is uh, questions. Uh, meanwhile, I, I still have a few more questions uh, yeah. to small that I think are interesting. So if you want to ask something, you can use the raise hand button on the lower left of your screen. And then uh, you can, I, can, I can tell you to unmute and you can ask a question uh, verbally. Um, so meanwhile, uh, I have another uh, few remarks. I really like your idea of the Stack Overflow kind of functionality where you have a question and answer on your uh, web platform. I use Stack Overflow a lot, like many people. It's uh, For people who don't know it, it's a nice uh, platform where you can ask questions uh, normally on, on, on software and that people can answer those questions, but people can rate the question and the answer. So you always get close to a good answer 
to, to see first the answers that get a high rating. Works really well. And there's some more and more about that. Um, the other thing that you mentioned is also very important. Share the best of your knowledge as open educational resources. Because people think indeed it's free, so it's crap. But if we look at our business model, you want to show the best stuff to that potential audience that might also want to engage with you in, in, in projects uh, with, with budgets. So I think that's a really good uh, point to take home is you should not just put bad materials out there which are not well designed or, you know, it's about creating the experience. Also something that you mentioned, I think is very important. People need to feel confident that with you as an expert, they're in good hands and, and you, they can see it on social media that you're engaging with the community, that you're an expert. It's all part of the, the whole landscape that you create around those uh, materials. Um, yes, you have to, to give, and I, I learned that, I, I didn't learn that on my hydro, hydro geology or my hydro courses, I learned that on a conference of web media. Ah, good. <laughs> I never learned it. <laughs> was watching and say, okay, how can you engage your users? You have to give the best. I mean, this, but we were not, I mean, you have a lot of experience in researching tools for the, your platforms and so on, and me as well. But nobody, nobody took classes on that. I mean, we, we have to learn by your own how to develop a website, followers, and how to develop channels and so on. And I think in the future, maybe it will be some guidelines when right now is like the wild west of what you do. How can you do things and how can you reach people and you, and as I told you, you can do a lot of benefits and maybe you can do a lot of harm as well. I see that we deal with it in a very practical way. We discussed it uh, last night about, okay, if you, you look for information on open educational resources, there are many things are very theoretical or come from uh, the education background. Well, we are more the people who uh, figure it out by doing and finding our way in what is then the best way uh, to do that. Um, of course, the theory is also important, but I think learning by doing in this sense is also very important. And therefore, I think what we, we present is what, what we learned. But for other people that might be different or they can come up with, with different challenges or different um, uh, opportunities also that, that we didn't even see. So that, that would be also good to learn about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, the, I think that there is um, a lot of opportunities to, to develop. And I, I would like to have more tutorial, more more websites because imagine that there were two websites doing tutorials on groundwater modeling. Like it will be like something that is great is the challenge in between the websites and to say, okay, I did that. Oh, you did that. I did that. So and this is and people will see that. Okay, people see, people watch, people comment, and and we are happy on that because we know we can reach further audience. I mean. We, you can reach people and say, oh, I, well, I was looking at your, at your videos and this where they saved me. <laughs> okay. You say, they, they saved me. I want to put you on the reference of my thesis. Okay, yes, you can put, maybe it was not the idea, but, but uh, um, well, you, you know, because they told you, you know, but sometimes they don't, they just, it's something that you have to assume that is happening. Yeah, there are lots of assumptions, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any questions from the audience, from the e-learning team, um, from Nadine, maybe yourself? I have a question, yeah. Yes. I was wondering, uh, so first of all, thank you very much for your presentation, very insightful. Um, I was wondering if you could say something about how, how, you, how you started, how do you get into this type of uh, product development, uh, this interests? Because I'm sure that you, you did not start straight away with a, with a website, or maybe you did. <laughs> yeah, um, on, the, on the history is that I wanted to, I am a groundwater modeler 
Uh, groundwater modeler is a very individual type of guy. I mean, you there are not many groundwater modelers. So I wanted to teach groundwater modeling. Uh, because if, but if you want to teach groundwater modeling, you have to teach some hydrology concepts and GIS. And this is the main reason of doing this uh, in person, in person, because at the beginning was not online, was uh, to develop uh, material for, for these courses. But uh, the topic about posting them online was because, was because I want to to teach intermediate stuff. I mean, not the basic stuff. I wanted to teach intermediate stuff. So I wanted to, to give intermediate courses and making some material on the basic courses. In, in Spanish, that happens. Um, but in the end, as, as a well on the challenge of open education is to give intermediate courses is really hard people are most, mostly stuck on the basic stuff. So, and, uh, and I think that most of the education in open education will be only, and this is more critical than, will be basic stuff. I mean, basic stuff about some modeling, some software or some methodology. Because yeah, uh, also the same for, for the GIS stuff, that the bulk of the people uh, still need the good basic stuff. And of course, there is a part that is disappointed that you don't go into the advanced things. But yeah, that's the basics are super important in our work. Good, good practice, the good foundation. Yeah, and sometimes I give advanced tutorial, not well, trying to reach maybe the ten percent of all the followers because, like, for a single follower, I am talking another language. I mean, it's not like it's completely unreachable. Um, Great. There are questions in the in the chat. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Nadine, maybe you, you can. Yeah. yeah. So there's a question from Raquel from the IGE learning team. She asks any tip on how to made motivate more traditional teachers to reduce amount of content and share it open. Oh. <laughs> Think to make shorter clips. I'm not sure if that's meant, but uh, of course, uh, the main question is how do you motivate them to share uh, stuff uh, openly? Yeah, Any idea at all? <laughs> it's really hard. It's extremely hard. It's, I mean, like it, for me, it's like the same of groundwater modelers that use commercial software turning into open software. It's like behavioral it's, change, which is difficult. It's behavioral. It's, I mean, you, you need that the, the classroom, you need, maybe you need situation like this quarantine in order to, to change of the approach because um, teachers are, I really think that teachers are on the comfort zone. They are really, they, they want to teach their class, they have their materials and say, why I do give this online? And maybe they are afraid that if this is online, they will require less from the teacher. That's indeed a good one, yeah. I think that a good solution is motivation. You have to give them motivation. And once you are in, it's easy to stay motivated. Because if you look at uh, nice comments, nice feedback that you get from, from people, that, that's like dopamine. It's like chocolate. It's like <laughs> yeah. you immediately fall in love with, with the work you're doing. So that's, but the problem is getting into that mode and, and providing things and then increase that amount. There's a addition from uh, Laura Kwak from the communication office of IG Delft. She says, from a comms perspective, you need to show successes that others have made by doing so. I completely so agree. You. That always helps. Yeah. Uh, there are two other questions made by Erik without Cam or Mike. Yeah, that's Erik Meerberg. Uh, <laughs> okay, thanks for the addition. He says, I think it is most interesting that you both see open education as part of a business model where you have more expensive other products that make this possible. Is that the only possible business model for open courses or do you also see other options? Um, okay, Hans, I guess I, if you want to <laughs> I think there's always other business models possible, but this is just one that 
uh, that I always work with, which is not even one that, uh, that I think everybody uh, works with. Uh, but another possibility of, uh, of having, having open educational resources is not to drag people into your uh, more expensive courses, but it can even be just about uh, being personally recognized as an expert or pulling people into using your software, for example. There's also commercial software providers that provide free courses to drag people into paid licenses. We don't do that, of course, because we find that uh, not the right thing to do. But there can be many other reasons for uh, offering free stuff. Because you know also, uh, and Eric knows that too, in the open source world, there's nothing really free. There's always something meant with free. Nothing like a free lunch. Huh? Um, for us, we wanted to develop. In the, we were thinking in developing some online platforms, like platforms to do spatial analysis, water chemistry analysis, and so on, um, and to sell some kind of license or like to doing our own groundwater modeling software. Um, so far, this this topic of Posting tutorials and selling courses is very is quick. I mean, you you develop something quick while you know well if you want to send a license, it can take more time, and then you need more people, and then you have, share, you have to share you have to to charge more. I mean, it will be more expensive the product that you have. That's a good point. Yeah, the the open educational resources are really low. Uh, level in the sense that it doesn't cost much to set it up. Mm -hmm. Oscar. Yeah, there was one more question from Eric. Yes. <laughs> uh, he asks, um, you mentioned the five minute max for millennials. So yeah. how do you get more advanced stuff to them? Well, they're very good multitaskers. So just pocket everything in five minute pieces and they will watch many five minute pieces from their phone. So it's it's just uh, the contrast between long full uh, lectures of uh, two times 45 minutes that we normally have. And just cutting it into specific learning objectives, specific topics that are just a few minutes and point them to the next one so they can have a break. Uh, do their side jobs and, and get back to, uh, to learning uh, little stuff. And then they do it asynchronous in the time that they like. And if they, uh, yeah, that, that's also how they watch Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I haven't, I haven't, well, I haven't been with an audience of that is devoted on the five minutes. I mean, for, for me, uh, I think that I have done maybe three tutorials that are, that are less than, than five minutes, but I really is, could spend one hour. And, well, it means that less people will see my videos, but in the end, I, and I think that the people that see are more committed. To, it, it depends a bit, uh, Sol. It's a bit, if you do a webinar, they, they can be quite long like this one. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are well attended. People keep the attention because it covers a specific topic and people subscribe and they know what they're going to. Um, we, we see, uh, of course, a dropout rate of uh, at least uh, 40, 50 percent. Also here, uh, 169 subscribers. There are 21 people in now, of which uh, probably uh, 10 percent from IHE. Mm -hmm. um, but if I look at the statistics from my YouTube channel, you also get the values of how long people watch your videos. Mm -hmm. Five minutes is long. <laughs> Normally, oh. they stay one and a half minutes to three minutes. I, I can I can share those uh, statistics too. But uh, if you check your your metrics from YouTube, you see that nobody stays, or nobody like uh, ninety nine percent stays uh, three minutes or less. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, could, yeah, it could be. Yes, it's it's a it's for another webinars, for webinars. It's perfectly okay to have a bit more time with a with a nice uh, little crowd that's really interested, like like the ones we are now still with, <laughs> and don't get bored of us. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, there's a comment from Oscar Herrera. Mm -hmm. I believe uh, he knows you, uh, so yeah, he, yeah, sends... <laughs> he he gives a comment to uh, Raquel's earlier question, saying, "Also, you cannot reduce the content of the courses in order to properly use it. With the online learning, it is possible to run a tutorial on how to apply Hackrash." 
for example, for flood extension modeling, but you cannot explain the San Fenon equation. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Yeah, almost. But it's it's about so, indeed some things you can't cut in pieces. You know, it's, uh, it doesn't make sense. So it's still, common sense is of course important. If your topic is to work, walk through a full model or to do uh, the, the San Fenon equation uh, derivation, then yeah, you need to take your time uh, for that. It's also the question if then online or open educational resources are the, the perfect way and which form uh, with many things. Also, I discussed that with Sol before. Yeah, people also have to do some work themselves by learning it. So interactivity is important. Yeah. For example, for groundwater modeling, they, they want to do a model and say, but do you know hydrogeology? And they say, uh, maybe they are more deep into developing something like to know in the basics, no? And this is a this is a gap. We can recommend this. Okay, maybe you have to take some hydrology stuff. Maybe you have to improve that, and maybe they 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 will follow your advices. But in some cases, no. I mean, like people want to. For me, people appear and say, okay, I have three weeks to the end of my thesis, and I have to develop a groundwater flow model, and they say. I'm sorry. I mean, there is no way. There is no course. There is nothing. I mean, you're. <laughs> you have to be realistic. <laughs> what you ask is completely unfeasible, no? Um, like, yeah, maybe this this is this commentary is kind of an education. Say, so, okay, you have to be focused, and you have to measure your capabilities and your times in order to deliver something. And maybe we are educating in this way as well. I see the same with face-to-face. -face, huh? So I often get the question for tailor-made trainings. Can you do one day Python and one day QGIS? Uh, you have to refuse those things, you know, because yeah, unless you have a very experienced audience that already knows how to program and knows the basics of GIS, it can maybe be useful, but most of the times it's not. And you will only get annoyed that many people uh, miss the basics. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So I think also time is up, Hans and uh, so I don't know if you wanna, if you have some final closure words. Uh, I would like to personally thank uh, Saul a lot for his very nice uh, presentation and insights in how he works with uh, Hatari Labs and uh, also to be with us at this very early morning for him. So great thanks to you, some virtual applause. And uh, I really hope that in the future we will cooperate more and that we can also organize courses together. We know that it's uh, on our wish list, so let's make it happen as uh, soon as we see opportunity for that. Okay, really, thank you, Hans. And something great about these open open courses because, like, you reach very interesting audience and very interesting people, and I'm really happy for that. For knowing people like Hans, for knowing other people that along the Along the way, uh, you say people, oh, I know you from, I know you, and then you, in the end, this is a rich human experience. Okay, it's not so online as you, as you can, as you might think. Um, another topic of the open, the open education, that means online education, this open and online education is, uh, it can complement really well with in person education and in person experience as well. No? And if you and if that happens for us here in Lima and around Latin America, you gave some in person experience and people will follow you more online. And this and this is another yeah, there's a link between the two. Yeah. Yeah, there is a link in between the two. And you have to to strengthen both no? the online and the in person. And we hope that we can develop more uh, more things with your institution and uh, thank you for the opportunity as well and um, well let's let's see that the that our um, the things will be when things are different from now maybe we can do some more interesting things today <laughs> Thank you. Thank you also all the attendees and uh, thanks for, uh, for engaging with us. Um, we'll post uh, the video online. You'll be updated uh, about that and uh, keep in touch. Have a great day or night wherever you are in the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, see you. Bye-bye.